What's going on guys, Lomax here, and today I'm going to be bringing you part 3 of a video series on how to level Gage from level 1 to level 80 OP 10. We're going to be covering Ultimate Vault Hunter mode in this video, which will cover levels 50 to 80. There's a couple of key differences between UVHM and the two previous playthroughs. First, in UVHM, everything will now scale to your level. There are things we couldn't do before, such as farming an unkempt Herald off of Savage Lee at level 24 in normal mode, because Savage Lee is around level 10. But in UVHM, he will always be two levels above your level, which means the unkempt Herald that drops will always be on level, within one or two levels. This is a big thing, because we can farm any piece of gear that we want without having to worry about it being under level. Second, enemies in UVHM will have twice the health of enemies in TVHM, and four times the health of enemies in normal mode. They will also have health regeneration, which makes damage over time effects less effective. To combat this, slagged enemies will now take three times the damage from non-slag sources instead of two, so slagging becomes a mechanic that you will have to get used to. It's not always necessary depending on your gear, but it will never hurt to slag your enemies. This guide is going to be structured a little differently than the other two. In those two, we had a natural progression due to the main story's level scaling, and we did a lot of farming to fill in gaps in levels between missions. Now there aren't going to be any in UVHM, so we can do whatever we want. We can start all the DLCs before we start the main story. We can reset our playthrough after getting halfway through the DLCs. There's a lot more freedom to do a lot of different things, but the goal is essentially to open up farms that will help get to the endgame, and open up farms for endgame. We're going to start off preparing for UVHM with some farming in TVHM, and then hop around between the story and the DLCs in UVHM. After that, I will recommend some of the better farms that will help you level up quickly and get you good loot to use while you level up, but you will ultimately choose how you want to get to level 80. There are many different ways you can go about doing it, and it's really going to be up to what interests you the most. After that, we'll go over the skill tree and how we're going to progress through it from 50 to level 80. We're not going to cover the skills while we're leveling because I don't know what farms you'll be doing. Again, that's going to be up to you. Lastly, we're going to go over a bunch of gear. I'm not going to be able to cover every single piece of gear on Gage because then we'd be here all day, but it should be enough to get you ready for endgame and get you farming. If you check the Gearbox forums, you can find even more recommendations for gear there. Now I want to explain my approach on gearing in UVHM because it may be very different from some of yours. First, if an item takes a long time to get, I'd rather not farm it while leveling. Things like elemental conference calls, which are great on gauge, are not worth farming until you either hit max level or you need them for Digistruct Peak because you will outlevel them. So I tend to only farm things that are easier to obtain before hitting level 80, and even into the early levels of Digi Peak. Now, if you're hell bent on trying to get one at, let's say, level 70, well, feel free. I'm not trying to discourage you. Personally, I just don't think it's the most efficient thing you could do because you're going to outlevel it by the time you get to 80. I'd rather spend less time farming an item with a better drop rate and try to get to level 80 faster. Second, quest reward farming is terrible because you can only accept an item once. There are ways around this on PC with the stash, but I'm not sure about consoles, so I'm making this guide with the intent to do as little resetting as possible, at least until Digistruct Peak. And I'm not trying to discourage anyone from resetting, because things like the Fibber are great on gauge. But to get another one, you'd have to reset your playthrough. So if you are okay with resetting, I would just make sure you have whatever weapons you need to reopen any farms you may want to do after you reset. Basically, we're going to try to do reasonably simple farms, and hold off on quest rewards until level 80. It's a bummer, because a lot of Gage's strongest weapons are either quest rewards or just hard to obtain. But that's the way it goes sometimes. Let's get into this. We're going to load into TVHM to do some final preparations. First, head to the Iridium Blight. Right in front of the entrance to the Ore Chasm, which is on the south side of the map, there will be a loader named Mal who will give you the Real Boy quest line. You want to do this entire quest line with the last quest's objective being to kill him. After you kill him, travel into the Ore Chasm and back out again. Now if you're on PC, You'll want to save and quit and change your save file to read only. If you're on console, get ready to dashboard farm because we're going for a fibber. In case you were not familiar with farming this item, 
I have an old video on how to identify if you have the right fibber, which I'll link in the description. Basically, the fibber we want is the ricochet fibber. When you shoot the ricochet fibber, the bullet will split into nine bullets when it makes contact with a surface or a hitbox. Now this is huge because with a B shield, it is devastating. The additional pellets are unlisted, so all nine pellets get full amp damage from the B. If you get a redundant prefix on a ricochet fibber, I would re-roll because the amp damage will be split in half because there are two listed pellets and we're going to farm a B next. Other than the barrel, I wouldn't be too concerned with any of the parts unless you don't mind taking the time to get the parts you want. As far as elements go, I try to either get shock or non-elemental as they are both neutral to most enemies in the game. As I mentioned, the next thing we will be farming is a B shield. Pick up this just in for Mordecai and head to the arid boneyard. You have to kill Hunter Helquist, who's shacked up in a radio tower. Normally you have to go up the elevator and fight him, but you can actually get him out of the tower if you throw a singularity grenade at the door. If it damages him, he will come out and fight you. If you complete the mission, you will have to turn it into Mordecai, but you can continue with the same approach to this farm after that. Farm him until he drops a B shield. If you're unfamiliar with the shield, basically it's an amp shield with no drain so you can fire as many bullets as you want and get the full amp damage on all of your shots as long as your shield doesn't take damage. It's not a defensive shield, and it has a pretty high delay. I wouldn't say it's necessary either, but it will probably make your life easier, especially if you're not used to UVHM. After you have the Fibber and the B, go talk to Mordecai to pick up the quest Rackaholics Anonymous. Complete this mission and come back to Sanctuary. This is going to be another read-only or dashboard farm. You want to turn this quest into Moxie when given the option, and try for a Slag Ruby. This shouldn't be a bad farm because there's a 1 in 4 chance she will give you Slag. This will briefly be our slagging weapon and healing weapon until we get a Grog Nozzle and UVHM. If you're unfamiliar with this gun, while you have it in your hands, you will heal for 12% of the damage you deal. And this is not just limited to gun damage. It will include grenade damage, damage over time, whatever damage you can do. However, it will not include damage done by Death Trap. Moxie weapons become important in UVHM and very important in Digistruct Peak. You can play without them, but you need to have some sort of sustain, and this is just an easy form. Next, we'll farm an Unkempt Herald and a Fastball. I recommend Shock or Explosive for the Fastball. You might think having both the Fibber and the Unkempt Herald are a bit overkill. But these guns, along with a fastball, will still be nice to have, and are pretty easy to get, so it shouldn't take too long. And an unkempt herald with a B is also a really powerful combination, as the unlisted pellets on the herald get the full amp damage from the B. This only works as long as you do not have a double penetrating prefix. But the herald is still strong even without the B, and it's a nice alternative if you don't like using the fibber. Next, we're going to start the Captain Scarlet DLC in TVHM, not UVHM, to get a Pimpernel. Run the story all the way through until you get to the quest Whoops. Herbert will tell you to go to the Washburn Refinery to do an objective. When you get there, talk to Sensorbot and complete the quest I know it when I see it. Then pick up his second quest, don't copy that floppy. Do the objectives and get back to the Washburn Refinery. This will be another read-only or dashboard farm, this time for a Pimpernel. This is a Malawan sniper rifle that is really strong on gauge. It's really strong in general. It will always spawn in an element, so it should be pretty easy to get the element you want. I recommend either a Slag or a Shock Pimpernel. A Slag Pimpernel is probably the best slagging weapon in the game, but if you have a Slaga and because later on we'll get a Grog Nozzle, you may not need one and can go with Shock instead. Now if you want, and this isn't necessary, you can start Captain Scarlet's DLC in UVHM for a second Pimpernel for an element you did not get in TVHM. When you get to the Pimpernel, reset the playthrough so you will be able to farm another one later. It's important to reset now because you won't lose any access to any farms at this point in UVHM because you won't have unlocked any. So this is one way to get a Pimpernel without resetting any progress in the main story. The Pimpernel does not work like other sniper rifles, with which you want to crit enemies. When you shoot the Pimpernel and it hits something, a second pellet will spawn and project upwards before splitting into five pellets that branch out. Instead of aiming for the head, you want to aim at an enemy's midsection or leg to get the full effect of the second projectile, 
It may take some time to get used to, but this gun is very strong in all characters. With all the gear that we now have, we are ready to start the Tiny Tina DLC in UVHM. You'll have to clear Liarsburg first, but once you do, head to the Unassuming Docks to start it. Run through the storyline until you get to the Dwarven Allies quest. The Fibber and Pimpernel combined with the B should be all you need to get through this, and the Herald should help with any second wind name. When you get to the point where you talk to Claptrap about the rune, take it, and then you can talk to him again to pick up the quest The Beard Makes the Man. Starting this mission will give us the Grog Nozzle, the best healing weapon in the game and the only reason we are doing this DLC right now. You can swap the Ruby out with the Grog Nozzle for more effective healing. Make sure you do not complete this quest as you will lose access to this gun and would have to reset to get this. You will only have it while this mission is active. Now one other nice benefit of doing this DLC early on is that the treants that were killed earlier to collect the blood fruit can drop a bee. So now we have a new bee farm without having to get all the way through the story to get to Hunter Helquist. The best way to farm them is to fast travel to the Immortal Woods and then travel back through the waypoint into the forest so you spawn closer to them. And there are two tree ants here so you have two chances every run to get a bee. Next we're going to hop into the Hammerlock DLC. Complete all story quests up to the fall of Nakayama to unlock Candlerack's Crag and then talk to Hammerlock to pick up the quest Big Feet. You only have to do three story quests here, so overall getting to this point is pretty quick. For this quest, you will kill a giant crystallisk named Rouge who can drop a shotgun called the Hydra. This is a Jacob shotgun that consumes three ammo per shot with a very high pellet count and a terrible spread pattern, but Gage can make good use of it because of close enough. Rouge is pretty far away from the spawn, but this gun is a high drop rate, so I highly recommend it. It will be a good stacking weapon and can deal quite a bit of damage. After you get a Hydra, start the Mercenary Day DLC. You're going to run the first quest where you save the inhabitants of the town and fight Tinder Snowflake. Your reward for defeating Tinder Snowflake will be a giant chest. Now if you still have your Lady Fist, you can combine this with a B to kill him quickly, as the Lady Fist provides 800% bonus critical hit damage which is amplified by the B. If you sit in the area by the elevator and are back far enough, he will have a hard time hitting you, which will help keep your shield up. This won't work with the Shock Lady Fist as he will be resistant to it, so just use either the Fibber or the Unkept Herald in a B and it will work fine. We're looking for a couple of things here. First, you want to be on the lookout for a rocket launcher to use as a second winding weapon. A Topnia or a PBFG will be your number one choice. If you can't get either of those, go for a banded launcher. We will also want a turtle shield and transfusion grenades, ideally in slag. The turtle shield will lower our health to a point where it will be very easy to get above health gate with just a grog nozzle with enough anarchy and having the high capacity combined with blood soaked shields and unstoppable force should make us pretty tanky. It will also increase the effectiveness of the transfusion grenades because they will heal a higher percentage of our health. Next you will want to farm knuckle dragger for a hornet and maybe tree ants for a new bee if the one you have is under leveled. This will be an important combo for Uranus in the Fight for Sanctuary DLC where we'll be going next. Now we're going to start the Fight for Sanctuary DLC. The goal is to complete this DLC because there is an amazing rocket launcher farm in the raid boss arena. But this DLC is tough. New Pandorans are some of the tankiest enemies in the game and the final boss fight can be difficult. We're going to need a toothpick and a retainer shield for the hidden chest in the raid boss arena. Plus a toothpick will be great in the final fight, so you will want to farm at least a toothpick from sandworms when you get to the burrows. If you do the quest The Hunt is Vaughn, you will kill sandworm queens who can drop a toothpick at a much higher rate. The only problem is that they don't respawn, so you will have to read only or dashboard farm them. If you don't want to do that, you can still get them from regular sandworms, but it will likely take longer. After you complete the DLC storyline, talk to Hammerlock to pick up the quest A Most Cacophonous Lure to be able to enter the Writhing Deep. There is a hidden chest that you need these two items to get to. Equipping these items in the Writhing Deep will give you increased movement speed and jump height that will help you get to this chest. This is your new farm for rocket launchers while leveling. Topnias and PVFGs are much easier to get thanks to this DLC. You just have to master this route to get to them. Before we leave this DLC, there is one more quest we want to start. Talk to Moxie in the back burner to pick up the quest Space Cowboy. 
Scooter will then chime in over Echo and ask you to find three magazines. One of them, called Chest World, is in an outhouse near the doll abandoned fast travel station. When you open the outhouse, a loot midget is guaranteed to spawn as long as you do not grab the magazine. If you accidentally pick it up, either Dashboard or Alt F4, you do not want to lose this farm. We're not doing anything with it right now, but we will keep it open for later, so do not pick up the magazine. If you save your progress after picking it up, you will either have to do a different, less efficient loot midget farm, or you will have to reset your playthrough to open it up for farming again. Now we have healing and second winding pretty much covered for the rest of UVHN. The goal now is to get to level 80 and to open up farms for gear we'll need at endgame. If your gear is not hitting as hard and becoming underleveled, refarm on level gear. I recommend trying to leave any quest reward farming for max level so you don't have to reset your playthrough when you get there. If you farm unkempt heralds, hydras, new launchers, and hornets, you can get by for most of what I'm going to recommend to farm. Of course, there are other weapons you can farm, and we'll go over those at the end. These are just all easy farms with a low time investment. The one quest reward I'm going to recommend you pick up is Moxie's Endowment. This is a quest reward from the Good, the Bad, and the Mordecai. It's a relic that will increase the experience you earn from combat, so it will help you get to level 80 faster. Before we dive into the farms, I want to talk about how Gage is meant to be played with this build. When you load into a game and start with no anarchy, you have to be patient to get your stack count up. Jacob's shotguns are good stacking weapons because they have a low mag size and you are constantly reloading them. And if you get a kill with one, you have a chance to get 4 stacks from the kill and ensuing reload with typecast Iconoclast. And Rational Anarchist will give you a nice head start too. If you're not comfortable using Jacob's shotguns with low anarchy, use something else until you can go in on a pack of enemies. There's a reason we got the Pimpernel before we entered UVHM. The Herald can also work from range, but the projectiles are slow, so your ideal target will be stationary or running right at you. The Fibber with a B will also be a good option, as with close enough, the Ricocheted projectiles will target an enemy. Once you have enough stacks, you'll want to play aggressively. More so if you have a really high stack count, because you'll be inaccurate from range. You'll have to get a feel for when you're strong enough to go all in, but if you have a good launcher for second winding, you should be able to use that should you go down. Keep in mind you do want to be aware of your surroundings. If you go full Rambo into a large group of enemies, you can still go down. And the problem isn't being able to get a second wind because you'll have more than enough damage to do that. The problem is repeatedly going down and having an instant bleed out and fight for your life resulting in lost stacks. If you go down more than twice in a short amount of time, take cover, heal up, and reassess your surroundings before going back in. Unstoppable Force will help with this because when you get a second wind, you will get a large increase in movement speed to help run for cover. I want to mention a mechanic in the game that becomes more important in UVHM, especially in the OP levels, and that mechanic is health gating. If you are above 50% of your max health, then a single attack from an enemy will not put you into fight for your life. That is why the use of healing weapons becomes very popular in UVHM. The Grog Nozzle has the highest percentage to heal of any Moxie weapon and can slag, so overall it's a fantastic utility weapon that we'll be using for a while. So what's the plan to die less? First off, I wouldn't use a B shield unless you were using a Fibber or a Lady Fist because it's not a good defensive shield. Save it for bosses. With a Turtle Shield, your health will be taken so low that it should be easy to get above Healthgate with the Grog Nozzle in your hands. Plus, you'll be a tank with blood soaked shields and unstoppable force. With enough anarchy and a turtle shield, you can literally shoot the ground near an enemy with a grog to fully heal. And later, when we look at the skill tree, we'll see some more helpful things. Grenades are often used in tandem with the grog for healing. Because fastballs are so powerful, hitting an enemy with one holding the grog can put you at full health. Transfusion grenades or Tesla grenades also pair well with the grog and transfusion grenades are great with a turtle shield. If you don't want to rush in, you can always sit back with the Fibber and a bee and shoot the floor and walls and things will probably die. As long as you continue to upgrade your bee, you can use your level 50 Fibber all the way to level 80, but it will be useless the moment your bee goes down. And don't forget to slag things. If you have enough anarchy and your gear is on level, you may not need it depending on the enemy, but it's a good habit to get into. Stack management is also going to come into play here. 
Most guns past 200 stacks are going to be hard to use unless you are in an enemy's face. There are exceptions such as the Fibber and the Conference Call due to the nature of how these guns work, but for the most part, you shouldn't need more than 200. I'm not saying you can't go above it, but again, you will have to face tank enemies. Don't forget about Discord if you have too many stacks. It will give you bonus accuracy and fire rate, along with health regeneration that may be helpful depending on the situation. Now we're going to go over some of the better farms to do. We've already covered two of them. The first being Tinder Snowflake and the Mercenary Day Chest. This is a great farm for new gear. It's not the most efficient experience-wise, but you will get a pretty decent amount and you will get a literal train car of loot with guaranteed shields, grenade mods, rockets, and class mods, along with various weapons. For the fight itself, remember to use the Lady Fist if you have one with the B. Like the Fibber, you can use a low level one with a B and as long as the B is up and on level, your Lady Fist will still do a ton of damage because the damage is coming from the fact that you have a B. Uranus is the other farm here. He gives pretty decent experience and drops a ton of loot. You will have to go to the fast travel at the other end of Helios Fallen and save and quit after reaching it in order to spawn there. Once you do, Uranus is only a short walk away. For this farm, I recommend a Hornet and an on-level B both of which are pretty easy to farm. If you are on PC, Mick Zafford is arguably the best farm in the game for experience as you spawn right next to him and probably won't have to deal with slow load times that console players experience. You can get to 80 in just a few hours of doing this farm, but it will be a grind. You will want a slagging weapon for this farm, and I recommend a slaga or a slag pimpernel. A grog nozzle will work, but it won't be as efficient because of the drunk effect slowing your fire rate. If you are going to start this farm, I recommend getting either a Shock or Explosive Fastball first because you can one-shot him if he's slagged. You can run the Clan War questline all the way up to the showdown as we did in TVHM, but do not pick a side yet. If you slag Mick, one Fastball should take him down. The benefit of not picking a side means that when you run out of grenades, you can look for more nearby without anyone shooting you. Now the Fastball will eventually fall off after a few levels, and you won't be able to one-shot him, but you can grab a Maggie that he drops and use that instead. It's a slower kill, but it's sustainable all the way to 80 because he will just keep dropping better Maggies as you level up. Slag him up and then fire the Maggie until he's dead and then repeat as long as you like. On PC, it takes somewhere in the range of 10 to 15 minutes to gain a level depending on how quick your reflexes are. If you do this method for a few levels at a time, just keep in mind that any gear you had will be under level. The Maggie is a strong gun though, so it will help you out, and there are no enemies in the Writhing Deep, so farming a rocket launcher will be easy as long as you have your Toothpick and Retainer. Pyro Pete's Bar Brawl is the console-friendly version of the Mick Zafford farm because you don't have to keep loading into the game. I highly recommend getting either a Shock or Fire Topnia for this one, and a PBFG in the same elements if you can't find a Topnia. I also recommend getting an Absorption Shield from the Mercenary Day Chest or Uranus. You will also need a low-level Logan's gun. For this, you can go back to normal mode and farm Wilhelm. Shoot your feet with the Logan's gun while wearing an absorption shield to regenerate rocket ammo, and now you don't have to waste money at an ammo vendor buying rockets. You'll have to start the Torg DLC to get to Pyro Pete's bar. There's nothing too challenging before the bar, so any items we've gone over will work here. Once you get to Pyro Pete's bar, you'll have to do Bar Brawl tiers 1 and 2 first. Once you've done these two missions, you can pick up tier 3 and repeat it as many times as you want. All you have to do here is kill the badasses within the time limit to complete the quest. You're going to use your launcher to blow everything up, and as you continue to do it, your anarchy stack count will increase and so will your damage along with it. You can also collect Torg tokens if you want to spend at the Torg vendors. But this is another effective way to level because you get XP from both the enemies and completing the quest over and over. I recommend respecking if you're going to do this farm. Take points out of blood soaked shields because with the amount of enemies you'll be killing, your health can get pretty low, and throw them into pre-shrunk cyberpunk because you'll want 400 stacks for faster killing, especially as your rocket launcher becomes more and more underleveled. Take wires don't talk in the middle tree if you have a shock launcher, and then take interspersed outburst no matter what you have for slag. These are two skills we'll go over more later, but they will be useful right now. The better half in Fancy Mathematics will also be good to have here, and then you can spec into any other skills you want. There's another good farm you can do in the Arid Badlands. 
Basically, you can run through the whole area looking for rabbit skags and tubby skags, the latter of which are important for farming at level 62 and above for legendary class mods and specific pearlescence. Along with the skags are Bonehead, who can drop a bone shredder and a number of chests. Saturn is also here if you have the gear to kill him, but if you don't, he's probably not worth the time investment. As I mentioned, tubby farming will be important at level 62 and above, especially since we'll be looking for a legendary anarchist class mod. There are a bunch of other places to tubby farm, so don't feel limited to the arid badlands. Basically, anywhere you can find stalkers, skags, varkids, or spider ants are areas you can find tubbies. You can also get tubby midgets in some areas, and even tubby bones in the Tiny Tina DLC, but the arid badlands is the most efficient place to farm. The last method I'm going to show takes place in the Bloody Harvest DLC. For this one, you need to complete the first quest from TK Baja and fight the Bloody Kingpin. After you complete the quest, you can farm Jaco Lantern. Now for this, you'll want a Lady Fist and a Bee. You want to crit him in the head until he's dead, which sounds easy enough. But this fight can be tricky because he has a lot of minions that can attack from range and he can heal. I recommend picking up the yellow candy that can drop as it will give you movement speed to help dodge attacks. If you can get the body down, his head will pop off and fly around. When this happens, you want to grenade jump out of the arena and make your way back to the save point to reset the fight. You get a lot of experience for downing the body and can repeat this as many times as you want. You need to be careful not to get hit by the fire that the head spits out when you try to get out of the arena, because you may not be able to get a second wind if all his minions are dead. Now we're going to take a look at the skill tree. This is the build that we started UVHM with at level 50. Now we're going to do this a bit differently compared to the first two parts. I can't show you what your build should look like at certain points in the story because everyone will be in a different place. I will show you the final build and how we get there though. At level 51, we're going to put the last point into more pep. We started specking into this in TVHM, and now it will be maxed out. At level 52 through level 56, we're going to spec into Mylan. For every point, this skill grants shock resistance at 6% per level, which is not amazing, but it also increases our shield capacity by 3% per level. This capacity increase is not great for the B because it means it has more to recharge, but it is nice for turtle shields which already have a large capacity. Also, with blood soaked shields and unstoppable force, it should be harder for enemies to break through our shield. At level 57, we're going to throw a point into shock and awe. This is a cool skill that will set off a shock nova every time we reload. Paired with Jacob shotguns or any low magazine weapons, you'll be setting off novas every few seconds that can apply a dot effect. This also will give you more efficient healing when paired with a grog nozzle. With a turtle shield, you can essentially face tank enemies as long as you are shooting your grog at them to ensure you keep reloading. At level 58 until 61, we'll be specking into Electrical Burn. With this skill, anytime we apply a shock dot on an enemy, there will be a chance that a fire dot is applied to the same enemy. It is a pretty small chance, but it's not the worst skill to take here, and it actually is okay against fleshy enemies. This will also amplify the effects of Shock and Awe and give you more damage over time to help you out even further with healing. At level 62 until 66, we're going to spec into Wires Don't Talk. This is a great skill that buffs all shock damage by 3% per point. It's like having a miniature built-in Bone of the Ancients, which is an important relic that we'll cover later. The plan with Gage is to transition into a shock build at endgame, so as you're leveling, it's really only going to buff Shock and Awe and any Shock weapons or items you might get. But it's one of the better skills in a tree with a lot of underwhelming skills and will be useful in Digistruct Peak. From level 67 until 71, we're going to spec into Interspersed Outburst. This is going to be our slagging skill. Out of all of the character slagging skills, it's not the best for slagging, but it's kind of the only one Gage has, with Make It Sparkle being the only other contender. If you don't shoot an enemy for 2 seconds, you gain a stack of interspersed outburst, and you can have a maximum of 5 stacks. Based on how many stacks you have, you will deal a certain amount of slag damage and have a certain chance to slag an enemy. The more stacks you have, the more damage you will do and the higher your chance of slagging the enemy. If you hit an enemy when you have any amount of stacks, those stacks are reset to 0. Now again, we're doing this for the slag chance rather than the damage. 
and with more pep maxed out, the slagging chance increases a little bit further. At this point, we have all of the core skills for Anarchy Gauge, and now with the level cap increase, we can buff Deathtrap a little bit and improve his mobbing capabilities. At level 72, we're going to spec in to make it sparkle. This skill will allow us to apply an element to Deathtrap by shooting him with an elemental weapon. It actually buffs Deathtrap quite a bit as you can increase his melee damage based on the element you apply. Applying Slag to Deathtrap will allow him to slag enemies when he melees them. Or you can give him another element to put his melee to good use. At level 73 through 77, we're going to spec in a 20% cooler. This skill will get Death Trap off of cooldown faster. Every point will increase the cooldown rate by 6%. Getting Death Trap back faster means you can deal more damage and draw aggro more often. At level 78, we're going to pick up Sharing as Caring. This skill will give Death Trap a copy of the shield you were using. Now this skill can be good or bad. It really depends on what you are using when you summon Death Trap, because that determines what shield he spawns with. If you are using a B, then this skill won't be any good. If you are using a Roid Shield, then Death Trap will get a nice melee boost. Now you can run around with a Roid Shield, then summon Death Trap so he has the Roid Shield, then switch your shield to something else and you will still have the Roid Shield, but it really depends on if you want to play this way. It's pretty annoying to have to switch shields mid-fight, but it will be the most efficient if you want to maximize his melee damage. When we go over shields, we'll talk more about ones that have good synergy with this skill. At level 79, we're going to spec into Upshot Robot. This is a one-point skill that will increase Death Trap's timer and his melee damage for every kill you or he gets. This will help him kill stuff faster and can allow him to stay out for a really long time. Sometimes he'll get taken down instantly and there's nothing you can do about that but other times he can be up for minutes with this skill. Finally, at level 80, we're going to throw one point into Strength of 5 Gorillas. The Legendary Anarchist class mod buffs this skill, so we'll have 6 points here with that equipped. This skill increases Death Trap's melee damage by a small amount at 3%, but again, we're taking it because of the Legendary Anarchist mod. When we start Digistruct Peak, there may be a couple of points that we move around, but the build as we have it here should be fine to run with at level 80. With a Legendary Anarchist class mod, you'll be flying around, running from enemy to enemy and crushing them. Meanwhile, load up Death Trap with an element and watch him go to work. His damage may surprise you. Now that we've covered the skill tree, we're going to talk about some good gear for Gage. In the interest of time, we're only going to cover at maximum two pieces of gear per weapon or item class, and we're going to keep it to items that are easier to obtain. There are a lot of good items for Gage that are hard or a pain to farm, especially ones from raid bosses, that we're not going to cover in this video. Some we will cover in the next video as we go through Digistruct Peak, but I will put a spreadsheet in the description with a whole list of gear to try along with their drop sources, including Uniques, Legendaries, Seraphs, and Pearls that we're not going to cover in this video. I encourage you guys to watch other videos and check out other sources for more information on gear. One important thing to keep in mind in UVHM is that matching elements against enemies is key to dealing the most damage possible. Dealing fire damage against flesh, corrosive damage against armor, and shock damage against shields will be the most efficient. Shock and non-elemental damage types are neutral to flesh, explosive and shock are neutral to armor, and non-elemental is neutral to shields. By neutral, I mean you get no benefits or penalties for using these elements on these enemies. When you're farming for gear, this is something you want to have in the back of your mind because at endgame, it often means farming guns in multiple elements if they can spawn with more than one. Now for the gear. The first assault rifle we're going to cover is the Hail. This weapon is a unique Vladoff assault rifle that fires projectiles in an arc pattern. After a certain distance traveled, the projectiles split into two. This gun is a quest reward from completing round 5 of Fink Slaughterhouse. It also happens to be a moxie weapon and always spawns with an element. It takes some time to get used to using this gun because of its strange bullet trajectory, but it can deal a lot of damage and is useful for raiding. It has an innate critical hit damage bonus and additional splash damage. The second assault rifle we're going to cover is one we mentioned earlier, the Toothpick. This weapon is an effervescent assault rifle that fires 10 projectiles for the cost of 6 ammo. It is a very strong weapon introduced with the Fight for Sanctuary DLC. 
Paired with a mouthwash relic, it can pump out a ton of damage. The only downside to this gun is that it only spawns in fire. This one drops from Sandworms in the Fight for Sanctuary DLC. The first pistol we're going to cover is the Fibber. We mentioned the Fibber already, but I want to bring it up here because it's such a good item on Gage. It's a Hyperion pistol that is given as a quest reward for Mal for completing a real boy human. The Fibber itself is not a hard weapon to get, but it can be more difficult to get one with the right barrel and element. Again, we're looking for the Ricochet barrel indicated by having the highest base damage on the gun card. Luckily, you can spawn right next to Mal in the Iridium Blight to make this farm much easier. The second pistol we're going to cover is another one we've mentioned, the Hornet. This is a dull pistol that always spawns with a corrosive element. It comes from Knuckle Dragger in the Windshear Waste. The best way to farm this is to enter the Windshear Waste from the Southern Shelf. Then you will be right next to Knuckle Dragger and ready to farm. The reason I mention this one over other pistols is because it's really easy to farm, and it's also a great weapon in Digistruct Peak and against armored enemies in general. The Hydra is the first shotgun we're going to cover. As a reminder, it's a unique Jacob shotgun that drops off of Rouge in Candlerack's Crag after completing the mission Big Feet in the Hammerlock DLC. This one has a high drop rate, but it does take some time to get to Rouge. It has a really high pellet count and will help you gain stacks quickly. It will be most effective by firing it directly in an enemy's face, as it has a pretty wide spread even without Anarchy. The second shotgun we're going to cover is the Conference Call. This is a legendary Hyperion shotgun that can either drop from the Warrior or from the Handsome Sorcerer in the Tiny Tina DLC. Now normally this is a hard farm to get because these two drop sources have pretty crowded loot pool with a number of legendaries. While the final story mission is active, what you can do to farm this is save your game after you down the Warrior and before Lilith has you call in the Moonshot, and then get ready to either dashboard farm or read only farm for a conference call. This is the infamous Moonshot farm. The Warrior during the story mission has an almost guaranteed chance to drop a Legendary, so this is a much easier way to go about getting this gun. As for the gun itself, the projectiles generate additional projectiles after contact with an enemy or enough travel time. This is a really strong gun against larger enemies and certain raid bosses. I'm going to talk about two launchers that I mentioned already, but didn't cover in great detail. The first is the Tomnia, and it is an E-Tech Vladov rocket launcher that, like other Vladov launchers, consumes only two ammo for every three shots. It also has a fast fire rate compared to other E-Tech launchers, and a large explosion radius. With the addition of the hidden chest and the writhing deep, getting one of these is much easier than it used to be, so be sure to take advantage of this farm. The second launcher is the PBFG, and it is an E-Tech Malawan rocket launcher. It has a high base damage and consumes 2 ammo per shot. Like the Topnia, it also has a large blast radius. Again, this one can also be found in the hidden chest in the Writhing Deep. The Lasco is a unique doll SMG found in a pool of water in Frostburn Canyon. It will spawn in the same place every time you enter Frostburn Canyon, and might be the easiest farm in the game. It will always be non-elemental and has a high burst fire count with a large spread. Because of close enough, Gage can take advantage of the widespread, but it is most effective while shooting someone from point-blank range. The Bone Shredder is a unique SMG that drops from Bonehead in the arid badlands. It fires three bullets at the cost of two ammo per shot and has a high magazine size and low accuracy. If you can get an elemental one, you can do some pretty decent damage with it. The first sniper we're going to look at is the Pimpernel from Captain Scarlet's DLC. Now we talked about this one earlier, but this is another really strong choice on Gage. It has great synergy with the nth degree as the additional pellets that can hit count towards the end count. Overall, it's just a really strong gun no matter how many stacks you have. Once again, you can get it from completing the mission Don't Copy That Floppy given by Sensorbot in the Washburn Refinery. Another sniper rifle brought to us by the Fight for Sanctuary DLC is the Hot Mama. This is a Jacob sniper rifle that always spawns in fire. The reason that this is a good gun is that it does not suffer from the accuracy penalty brought on by anarchy stacks when you aim down the sight, so you can have 400 stacks and still snipe with this gun. 
It drops from Lieutenant Hoffman in the Mount Scarab Research Center after completing the mission BFFFs. The first class mod we're going to be talking about is the Legendary Anarchist class mod. This one drops from Tubbies at level 62 and above. It's probably the hardest item to get out of all the items we're covering here, but Tubbies have a tendency to drop class mods for the class you're using, so hopefully it doesn't take you too long. It is THE class mod to use if you're pre-stacking, and is a solid choice that we'll be running with in Digistruct Peak. It buffs Typecast, Iconoclast, and Smaller Lighter faster, which will help you gain stacks faster, and Unstoppable Force, which will cause it to grant even more movement speed on kill. The second class mod we're going to talk about is the Necromancer class mod from the Tiny Tina DLC. The Tina class mods work differently than other non-legendary class mods in the game. Instead of the skills determining the prefixes, they are determined by the stat bonuses. Ideally, you'll want either Chaotic Neutral for a Fire Rate and Mag Size bonus, or Chaotic Good for a Fire Rate and Reload Speed bonus. The easiest place to farm these is in the Unassuming Docks. If you come in from Flame Rock Refuge, there are two chests in line with each other that you can farm. The first shield that we're going to talk about is the B. This is a really nice shield to have in your back pocket. It has great synergy with guns that have unlisted pellets on their gun card, such as the Fibber and the Pimpernel, and can be very useful when you have no stacks. It can drop from Hunter Hellquist in the Arid Boneyard after the quest This Just In, or from Tree Ants in the Tiny Tina DLC. The second shield we're going to mention is the Black Hole that comes from Foreman Jasper in Opportunity. His name will be Foreman Rusty in TVHM and UVHM. He spawns after completing the mission Hell Hath No Fury given by Moxie. This shield has a singularity effect when it is depleted, which results in enemies being pulled towards you and staggered for a brief moment. It then releases a Nova, damaging nearby enemies. This is a nice shield to use as it gives you a form of crowd control, and it brings enemies to you which is nice with high anarchy, where you need to be close to your enemies. If you have sharing as caring, it will work the same way when Death Trap has it on resulting in even more crowd control. The first relic we're going to go over is the Bone of the Ancients. This is an E-Tech relic introduced with the first UVHM upgrade pack that can drop off of loot midgets. It will increase the damage of one elemental type and provide action skill cooldown reduction. This is an important one for endgame where having matching elements is key for combat. The best place to farm this with the addition of the Fight for Sanctuary DLC is the loot midget that spawns during Space Cowboy that we mentioned earlier. You can get Fire, Shock, and Corrosive Bone, so grab one in every element if you can. The second relic we're going to mention is the Deputy's Badge. This unique relic is a quest reward for completing the Showdown mission in Lynchwood. It increases shotgun reload speed and damage. This goes well with Jacob's shotguns as they will constantly need to be reloaded on gauge. The first grenade we're going to talk about is the Chain Lightning from the Tiny Tina DLC. This one drops from Badass Sorcerers. The most common place to farm them is in the Lair of Infinite Agony. We're using this one mainly as a healing grenade, as when paired with a Grog Nozzle, you will heal instantly as this grenade will impact nearby targets and chain through multiple enemies. It can take down shields of most mobs pretty easily, and overall is a solid utility grenade. The second grenade we're going to talk about is the Electric Chair from the Fight for Sanctuary DLC that drops from Uranus. This one is a Tesla grenade that shoots out multiple child Tesla grenades and ends with a giant shock explosion. It's a solid grenade that can be used for healing or damage. The only downside to this grenade is that it will always have a lot of delivery. Again, in the interest of time, there are a lot of weapons and items here that we are not covering. We'll see some additional items when we go through Didestruct Peak and go through those then and others you can find within the spreadsheet in the description below. That's going to wrap it up for this one, guys. Hopefully this helps you with the leveling grind, and next we're going to try to tackle Digistruct Peak. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you in the next one.